This session is entitled, Is a Steady State Economy Possible? And it is a direct continuation of the discussion that we started last week about the flaws associated with current statistical measures for assessing economic growth in general and with the problems of gross domestic product in particular. As we will see, the notion of a steady state economy is, perhaps surprisingly, an idea with roots traceable back to the 18th century and earlier. In the aftermath of the most serious economic collapse in approximately three quarters of a century, this idea has begun over the last two years to garner again an increasing amount of attention among sustainability champions. Moreover, this interest is not just from the intellectual margins, but is being encouraged to varying degrees by some very prominent and visible political figures. To start off, let me then reiterate a point from our last session, namely that it is widely believed that continuous economic growth is essential, indeed absolutely essential, to human survival. The prevailing view is that in the absence of economic growth, life as we know it would come to a crashing end. This perspective is so deep and pervasive that we rarely question its efficacy or wisdom. It is an idea that is just unreflexively embraced across the broad spectrum without any thought and certainly without any critical reflection. The prevalent view is that without economic growth, several ominous processes would quickly unfold. Borrowers, governments, companies, individuals would be unable to pay interest on outstanding debts. Corporate profits would disappear. Employment would plummet as demand for goods and services contracted. Tax revenues would decline and governments would be unable to provide public services including military programs that uphold national defense. At the same time, demands for government assistance, especially in the form of social services, would increase, perhaps dramatically. Scarcity would become a defining feature of everyday life. At the extreme, the human enterprise particularly what is currently understood to be the American standard of living, would wither and contemporary civilization would decline into barbarous hostility. Books with titles such as these, heralding a future without economic growth, are generally deemed to be the rantings of delusional eccentrics. This is the widely understood view, but a big question remains. Is any of it likely to be true? The fact of the matter is that we really don't know. The current global economic system is surely geared for growth, and the consequences of a protracted slowdown would likely be severe. The contemporary economy can be equated to a bicycle. It needs to keep moving to be able to stand up straight. Without movement, it falls to the side. But this is not an essential feature of mobility devices. It is rather a part of the purposefully built form of a bicycle. We could easily, though, envision different kinds of vehicles that would not require forward, or for that matter, backward movement to remain upright. Moreover, 
it is important to recognize that economic growth is a relatively recent feature of human civilization. For most of history, there was no economic growth of any great consequence. It certainly did not serve as an organizing principle of everyday life as it does today. We can construct longitudinal records that go back to the 17th century and indeed earlier and discover that throughout the vast majority of this time period society got along in one way or another without economic growth. As displayed in the graph here the phenomenon of an annually growing economy has been a feature of societal organization for only about 200 years. Let me just make a casual observation before we proceed regarding the way that we socially construct our individual understandings of what might bring upon crisis of really critical proportions. People who are disposed to dismissing doomsday scenarios founded on environmental claims are likely to embrace apocalyptic forecasts founded on the end of economic growth. Why might this be? We seem to orient ourselves in one direction or another in accordance with more deeply seated value sets. But the question still remains. Why question the conventional wisdom? Is it not the case that the mass of public or indeed even elite opinion is generally correct? Why rock the boat? After all, is it not far easier to just go along with the mainstream view and avoid risking all the opprobrium that comes with being a renegade of alternative and for many deeply unsettling points of view? The term conventional wisdom is used to describe ideas or explanations that are generally accepted as true by the public or by experts in a field. The term implies that the ideas or explanations, though widely held, are unexamined and hence may be reevaluated upon further examination or as events unfold. Modern usage of the term is generally attributed to John Kenneth Galbraith, a Harvard economist and close advisor to President Kennedy, who defined it in his famous book, The Affluent Society, as a name for the ideas which are esteemed at any time for their acceptability. And it should be a term that emphasizes this predictability. The notion that economic growth is an indispensable societal requirement certainly fits this definition. It is also useful to recognize that history is full of examples of societies that maintain resolute belief in an idea only to find out in due course that it was wrong. After all, as was noted in the last session, there is no shortage of cases of the phenomenon that, as Warren Buffett succinctly put it, things work until they don't. And this process of re revelation rarely proceeds cleanly and painlessly as the once heretical assertions of famous historical figures like Martin Luther and Galileo reminds us. Ideas that are tied to power rarely die quietly. At the same time, fierce and unrelenting criticism is generally a telltale sign that something curious rests just beneath the surface. In this sense, it's instructive to recall Einstein's keen observation when he said, Few people are capable of expressing with equanimity opinions which differ from the prejudices of their social environment. Most people are even incapable of forming such opinions. 
bad or patently wrong ideas are generally just ignored and in due course disappear. The onslaught of vicious recrimination against proposals to limit economic growth suggests that people in positions of power feel obliged to defend one or another of the perquisites which with, with which they have been endowed. Let us therefore ask, why do challenges to the relentless pursuit of economic growth prompt such powerful attacks? From where does the commitment to economic growth derive? And who are the prime beneficiaries of economic growth? First, economic growth compensates for ineffectual political leadership. As long as politicians can promise their constituents that they will get more this year than they did last year, there is no need to engage in the messy and difficult process of making choices. In other words, everyone gets a piece of cake, and better still, the piece gets bigger every day. Second, and more specifically, economic growth diverts attention from the growing chasm of income inequality in both the country and world today. As long as the promise is held out that the incomes of people at the lower end of the distribution will increase, it is possible to sidestep divisive political battles about the morality of the prevailing system. In other words, if I have reasonable assurance that my piece of cake tomorrow will be larger than it is today, I am less put off by the fact that someone else's piece is bigger still. <clears throat> Third, and expressed more boldly, the promise of economic growth postpones calls for the redistribution of income, both nationally and globally. Fourth, and moving in a somewhat different direction, economic growth provides justification for environmental degradation. The claim is that resources are necessary, as indeed they are, and that limits on their utilization are a drag on further increments of growth. We hear this argument made every day. In the course of everyday affairs, it is customary to confuse the notion of economic growth with the notion of economic development. We need to address this problem. Economic growth refers to an increase in the value of goods and services produced by an economic unit, generally a nation, over a specific period of time, generally understood to be one year, and measured in terms of gross domestic product. Economic growth occurs due to increases in population, increases in per capita consumption, or increases in both of these factors. Economic development, in contrast, is a qualitative change generally understood to entail a change in educational achievement, technological innovation, or income distribution. We are accustomed to thinking of economic growth as the normal condition and economic recession as the abnormal or deviant state of affairs. However, there is a third alternative that rarely gets attention, namely a stable or a steady state economy that is neither increasing nor decreasing in size. If one accepts the premise that the earth is a closed system with a fixed limit of biophysical resources, then economic growth in the customary quantitative sense becomes impossible 
beyond a certain constraint. And a steady state economy becomes the feasible alternative. In addition, if we understand sustainability in its strong sense, namely as what is biophysically required rather than what is politically practical, the question of whether we can continue to pursue continuous economic growth becomes unavoidable. How though have we gotten to this point where economic growth is the alpha and omega of public policy? The pace of economic growth over the past century is widely recognized as attributable to our ability to exploit dense energy sources in the form of fossil fuels, first coal, and then oil. From this historical point of view, the last 200 years have been extremely exceptional and indeed unique. Finally, it is important to point out that a steady state economy is not a static economy. Growth of non-renewable resource flows ceases to be viable, but growth of knowledge, creativity, innovativeness, and so forth can readily continue. Another factor is important to mention and we will take this point up in much greater detail in future weeks. Our unyielding commitment to economic growth is the result of a socially and politically combustible combination of factors. Contemporary life in the United States and elsewhere combines rising material expectations under democratic governance with human orneriness for social status and incessant advertising. Such conditions create the inevitable outcome of a growth economy. Under such circumstances, political freedom to express one's views without penalty gets redefined as consumer freedom to choose from a virtually limitless menu of material goods. The imposition of limits on any of these three ingredients, democracy, social status, and marketing, could diffuse the pressure to pursue economic growth. It is clearly unacceptable to backtrack on the process of political empowerment and enfranchisement, and I am surely not suggesting that this would be an appropriate strategy. However, from the earliest days of the country, it has been recognized that for freedom to flourish, it is necessary to impose certain bounds on individual expression and behavior. Freedom also entails responsibilities. Norms of conduct are less well established in how social status is pursued, and in recent years it seems that our sense of propriety in this respect has been severely challenged. The United States has been far behind its peer countries in imposing limits on advertising, and miles behind in restricting advertising to children. Gaining our sense of proportion in how we regulate these three volatile ingredients would likely go a long way in forging new commitments to sustainability. Or, as Herman Daly has said, once we have placed the basic premise of more is better with the much sounder axiom that enough is best, the social and technical problems of moving to a steady state become solvable perhaps even trivial. Let us look at the notion of a steady state economy in historical perspective. As I noted earlier, the concept of a steady state economy is not new, and it was more or less a foregone conclusion among classical economists of the 18th and 19th centuries 
that preoccupation with economic growth would, in due course, drop away. Indeed, Adam Smith, the founding father of contemporary economic thought, contended that there were limits to economic growth. He predicted that in the long run, population would push down wages, natural resources would become increasingly scarce, and division of labor would approach the limits of its effectiveness. He forecasted that economic growth would persist for perhaps 200 years, and this would be followed by the onset of a steady state economy. Thomas Malthus, who you may recall from a few weeks ago, was deeply pessimistic about whether economic growth could keep up with a growing population. It is though the political economist John Stuart Mill, who is best remembered today for early critical thinking about economic growth and the prospect of a transition to a steady state economy. Mill observed in 1848 that the increase of wealth is not boundless. The end of growth leads to a stationary state. The stationary state of capital and wealth would be a very considerable improvement on our present condition. A stationary condition of capital and population implies no stationary state of human improvement. There would be as much scope as ever for all kinds of mental culture and moral and social progress, as much room for improving the art of living, and much more likelihood of it being improved when mind ceased to be engrossed by the art of getting on. Similarly, John Maynard Keynes, the most prominent economist of the 20th century, noted that Avarice is a vice, that the exaction of usury is a misdemeanor, and the love of money is detestable. We shall once more value ends above means and prefer the good to the useful. The day is not far off when the economic problem will take the back seat where it belongs, and the arena of the heart and the head will be occupied or reoccupied by our real problems, the problems of life and of human relations, of creation and behavior and religion. These ideas were given an environmental or a proto-sustainability cast of mind by Nicholas Georgescu Rogan, a Romanian-born mathematician, statistician, and economist who moved to the United States after World War II and took up a position at Vanderbilt University. His major achievement was a book entitled The Entropy Law and the Economic Process, which sought to dismantle the entire intellectual edifice of economics and its preoccupation with individual utility and to reconstruct it around thermodynamics. This perspective has become the basis of the contemporary fields of ecological economics and biophysical economics. Another important figure in the development of the modern concept of a steady state economy was the economist Kenneth Boulding, who coined the term spaceship earth and once famously quipped that anyone who believes exponential growth can go on forever in a finite world is either a madman or an economist. In 1972, publication of the famous Limits to Growth report by Danella Meadows and colleagues marked a landmark event and catalyzed a lively public debate on economic growth and endless material throughput that persisted for nearly a decade. The contemporary figure that carries the most weight these days in discussions on a steady state economy is, though, without question, the ecological economist Herman Daly, 
who we have encountered in previous weeks. Daly was a doctoral student of Georgescu Rogan's at Vanderbilt, spent the first part of his academic career at Louisiana State University, and then worked in the Environment Department at the World Bank. Today he teaches in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Daly defines a steady state economy as an economy with constant stocks of people and artifacts maintained at some desired sufficient levels by low rates of maintenance throughput, that is, by the lowest feasible flows of matter and energy from the first stage of production to the last stage of consumption. Daly is notorious for posing the following question. Which relationship holds? Is the ecosystem or biosphere a constituent part of the economy, or is the economy a constituent part of the ecosystem? In other words, which element is the part and which is the whole? In this figure, the customary view is depicted where the environment is regarded to be a subsystem of the larger economic system. The ecosystem is treated as little more than a source of raw materials and a destination for waste outputs. Moreover, the arrows on the corners of this figure suggest, in accordance with conventional wisdom, that the economy can grow outward indefinitely, irrespective of any biophysical constraints. A second view is pictured here, where the economy is instead an open system embedded in the finite and non-growing biophysical environment. It seems clear that the second perspective is the correct one, yet we do not routinely act and our institutions are not designed in accordance with this awareness. Herman Daly is also known for presenting the following insight. At an earlier point in time, the world was a relatively empty place. In other words, the scale of the planet was quite large in comparison to the resource demands and waste generating capacity of human beings because the size of the human population was fairly small. Resource and waste transfers between the economy and the ecosystem were relatively benign and circular. Because the size of the economy relative to the size of the ecosystem, human activities did not present any overwhelming problems. Daly refers to this situation as the empty world scenario. Note in the figure the size of the economy and the size of the ecosystem. However, today we live in what Daly calls a full world. The human economy has reached such proportions that it is banging up against the limits of the ecosystem. Indeed, the human economy has become nearly as large as the ecosystem. The final issue that we are left to deal with in this session is to give some consideration to what a steady state economy might look like. In future weeks we will review several plausible and pragmatic strategies for how we might get there, but let me just hint at its central features. The first element of a steady state economy is that the consumption of non-renewable energy and materials would decline. Human pressure on ecosystems and global resources would dissipate. We would move in the direction of what we have talked about in prior sessions as one planet living. Congestion and sprawl would become less prominent as communities assume more livable proportions 
and economic activity became localized. People would labor fewer hours and work time would be more equitably distributed. This is a strategy that has been deployed particularly in France as well as in other European countries. It is the reason why it is common for our European counterparts to have six to eight weeks a year of paid vacation, as well as generous maternity and paternity leaves. These policies to a large degree are motivated by a desire, indeed a need, to shift people out of the labor force for periods of time as a way to limit the production of surplus goods and to strive for a more equitable distribution of jobs. Global resources would become more equally distributed as economic growth rates converged geographically and temporally in a sustainable and steady state economy. I would like you to conclude this session by asking you to view four video clips that highlight several points that we have discussed. The first is a short presentation prepared by an organization called the Center for the Advancement of a Steady State Economy that works to educate people about the fallacies of the growth economy. A second video clip features Gus Speth, the author of one of the readings assigned for this session and, among numerous other prof prominent professional roles, is the former Dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. The third video clip is a portion of a lecture delivered by Nobel laureate and Columbia University economics professor Joseph Stiglitz. Stiglitz is an outspoken critic of untrammeled globalization and is important for current purposes because he was recruited by French President Nicolas Sarkozy to chair, along with fellow Nobel Prize recipient, the Indian economist Amartya Sen, a commission to look into the problems of contemporary means of evaluating economic growth. Finally, more for amusement than anything else, I have uploaded to the course website the animated film version of the famous story, The Lorax, by Dr. Seuss. The Lorax is a celebrated fable that covers much of the same ground that we have discussed in this session. The popularity of the film perhaps provides an object lesson that the ideas we have outlined here are not as alien as they might seem at first. Children and adults continue to watch The Lorax every day and understand immediately the lesson that it conveys, namely, that in the long run, and even in the short run, the pursuit of economic growth is a pointless exercise, and if human beings are going to continue to thrive, we need to embrace the organizational principles of a steady state economy. And one final, final thing. Here is the web address to a recent entry by Herman Daly in the online encyclopedia of Earth, entitled, From a Failed Growth Economy to a Steady State Economy, that provides a readily accessible digest version of much of what we have talked about here. Thank you.